Hello, friends. I have come here to give you the absolute truth. Human beings are instruments built for joy. Look at me. There I am in full function of my purpose. This is my father. He is not an instrument built for joy. I am the complete opposite of everyone in my family. My father's a good guy. He just does everything the hard way. My father refuses to ask women or minorities for directions. Therefore, I only ask for directions from women and minorities. My dad's actually a very funny guy. He's got a brutal sense of humor. Uh, his new thing is he's greatly irritated with athletes who point to God in appreciation when they've done something well. We were watching the Little League World Series together this year. And the United States was playing Mexico. And some of those Mexican kids are pretty religious. And they'd point to God. And my dad would go, God doesn't give a shit about you, kid. It wasn't divine intervention that got you that double. It was your own hard effort. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you will be. Hey, that's me in 1976, everybody. I was nine years old. Where's that shitty little red, white, and blue glove now, Tommy? I sold the most candy on my team, and I got to go to a sporting goods store and pick out whatever I wanted. And it was 1976, and everything was red, white, and blue, and I picked out that glove. But this picture is also significant because uh, this is where I got my first kiss. There was a boy on my team. No, man, it was his sister. <laughs> Every year in my little town, they had a, the fireworks for Fourth of July at this Little League field. And me and my friend's sister snuck off to that dugout and we kissed during the Fourth of July fireworks. And to this day, I still love baseball, the Fourth of July. And sometimes when I kiss, I still see fireworks. <laughs> hey, the, the original title of this show was A Lifetime of Bad Haircuts. There's exhibit A, but it's not my fault. I come from the family of bad haircuts. <laughs> Look, me and my mom are about to fly away on the end there, man. <laughs> uh, that's me all the way on the left. I have to pee. <laughs> Look, man, I've always been about peace. I didn't just become this way. That's my brother John all the way on the far right. Uh, he's a perfect soldier, always has been. Very tough guy, my brother's always been tough on me. Uh, my brother told me that because I voted for John Kerry, I voted for Al Qaeda and the death of American servicemen <laughs> and women all over the world. My brother's a career army guy. You wanna upset my brother, all you have to do is bring up gays in the military. He goes, ape shit. I don't want no fags looking at my dick. Yeah, I bet they're all joining up specifically to look at your dick. I bet it's an incentive down at the recruiting office right now. I bet they have posters everywhere that say, join now and see John Rhodes' dick. I don't know how you feel about gays in the military, but I'll tell you one thing. If I'm in a war, watch my buddies die and get blown to pieces all day, I'm going to need a hug. <laughs> oh, just hold me, please. <laughs> Everyone was so mean. Hey, uh, these are my cousins. It's important to remember when cooking a Thanksgiving turkey to do it near all the cleaning products. <laughs> uh, they live in San Luis Obispo, California. That's my cousin, Ricky. Uh, he was actually murdered by the police three years ago. He was on crystal meth running down a ravine in a woman's dress. And apparently that will get you murdered in San Luis Obispo. Oh, that's my mother. My mother is from Buenos Aires, Argentina, everybody. That's where I get my tango sexy cool. <laughs> my mother emigrated to the United States when she was 13 years old, and she didn't speak a word of English. I love my mother more than any other human being on the planet. This is what my mother looks like today. My mother is a super Christian. She often wears a cape. <laughs> anytime I've ever asked, anytime I've ever had a problem in my life, my mother always basically gives, gives me the same advice. She always says, oh, honey, God will take care of it. <laughs> Mom, God let the Jews wander in the desert for 40 years. They're his favorite people. 
He let his own son get nailed to a wooden plank. What do you think he's going to put me through? <laughs> Mom, I'm even more worried than I was before. Oh, buddy, hang in there. I love art. Uh, I've traveled all over the world. I love going to museums. And you go to art museums all over the world in the gift shop, they always sell art slides. And I've collected all these art slides from all over the world. This is actually from Italy in the 1300s. Uh, apparently, during that period, it was very popular to fly Jesus kites. <laughs> I was born in Washington, D.C., everybody. I've always been very political and on top of uh, current events. Uh, personally, uh, I, I want the next president to be Hillary because Hillary's the man. <laughs> that should be her campaign slogan. I want Hillary or Obama because it pisses me off in a country as diverse as ours. Every election, we have the same two dorky looking white guys to choose from every election. Uh, I just want to say that I think this whole Michael Vick dog fighting story is about stereotypes and how one group is judged differently than another. I mean, really, if these were cats, nobody would give a fuck. <laughs> America loves dogs, baby. I love dogs. You could learn a lot from dogs, how to forget easily. How to always be ready for fun. I wish people were as friendly as dogs. I wish people greeted each other in the street with lots of sniffing and the occasional humping of legs. Some of my jokes are designed to make one person laugh at a time. That joke was clearly for you, madam. <laughs> you know, uh, one thing that was illustrated last week that really irritates me about this country there was that mall shooting in Omaha. You know, it's what really pisses me off about the United States. Once a month or every couple of months, some loser snaps, has to go to work or school or a mall and kill a bunch of people. We got too many losers in this country, man. That's why I think we should encourage suicide. <laughs> yes, life. It's not for everybody. <laughs> some people aren't strong enough for it, man. All bridges should be built with diving boards. <laughs> with a little sign next to it that says a quicker way to a better place. <laughs> hey, and if you're, having, if you're having emotional problems, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about anyone that would do harm to others, okay? Okay. <laughs> it's funny, whenever I'm in California, I'm always reminded of suicide. Because I don't understand how anybody could ever kill themselves knowing that an In-N-Out burger tastes so good. I mean, what problem do you have that you'd never want another In-N-Out Burger? An In-N-Out Burger's only in California, man. Seattle, Washington leads the country in suicides. Ain't got no In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, when I was 12 years old, my family moved from Washington, D.C. to Oviedo, Florida. I grew up 32 miles from uh, Cape Canaveral, where the space shuttle blasts off. I've always believed that anything is possible because I grew up where the space program is. And uh, I always, you know, actually now I think the space program is a waste of money. All those billions of dollars we could be doing so much more else to help people with. If you want to find out if there's life in outer space, we need to take some big, huge Marshall amplifiers and blast Jimi Hendrix music into outer space. Because if Jimi wasn't communicating with the aliens, I don't know who was. <laughs> Standing next to a mountain, chop it down with the edge of my hand. You could almost see the little alien heads go, what the fuck was that? Let's go check out that little planet. So I always wanted to be an astronaut. I was obsessed with the space program until I met Marla Coleman. The happiest day. That's the girl I lost my virginity with, everybody. Hey. The happiest day of my life was when, when Marla Coleman moved from Austin, Texas to Oviedo, Florida. And uh, she had the most syrupy southern accent, man. She just melted my heart. Oh, Tommy, you're so funny. And it was Florida, man. All we did was swim and kiss. And to this day, the smell of chlorine on a woman drives me crazy. 
if I ever come out with my own fragrance, it's going to smell something like chlorine and Hawaiian Tropic suntan lotion. <laughs> but I was in love with Marla, man. And it was over with Marla when she went to the 38 special concert with Kevin Yentz. And Kevin Yentz was the opposite of me, man. He was a big football jock with muscles, and he didn't read. And he wasn't cool and sensitive and artistic. And everybody in the school knew before I did, man. And I had to walk the halls in shame. You remember how things hurt you when you were young, man? I was devastated. And for years after that, I couldn't hear a 38 special song without feeling all tore up inside. Thank God they only had two hits. <laughs> so I want to thank Marla Coleman for not going to see the Rolling Stones. Yeah. She did me a service. Uh, that's my mom at Lake Charm in Oviedo, Florida. This is a few blocks from where I grew up. Uh, I remember there wasn't a problem in the world that couldn't be solved without a walk around Lake Charm with my mother. And uh, after Marla Coleman wiped her ass with my heart, we had to walk around that lake like a thousand times, man. And I'll never forget crying my eyes out to my mom. I was, Mom, I'm not cute anymore. I'll never be loved. Mom, but Kevin Yentz is a dick. But uh, I just wish when you were younger, somebody would tell you that those spots on your face will eventually go away. And that a few times in your life, you're going to have your heart completely ripped from your chest. But it's only pain, and it goes away, man. Hey, that's me. I, I, when I was 17 years old, I started being a comedian in Orlando, Florida at the Copa Cabana Comedy Club. The Copa Banana Comedy Club. <laughs> Still to this day, the worst name for a comedy club ever. Forget the fact that it's Florida and I'm wearing a sweater. <laughs> it was the 80s, man. That was cool then. Whatever merry-go-round was selling. Uh, but I was 17 years old, and I only, all my jokes were about the thoughts of a 17-year-old. I didn't have any adult human experiences, man. This was my best joke when I was 17, because uh, all my jokes were about, like, trying to get laid on dates. I was parked with this girl in my dad's Chrysler Baron, and we're smooching, and we're making out, and I unbuttoned her button on her pants, and she grabbed my wrist and pushed my hand away, and she said, if I do anything with you, what's it going to mean? I said, well, for you? A ride home. <laughs> it's still funny, man. <laughs> no, but that joke is sexist, man. And I don't want to be demeaning towards women. I love women. I think that women are the highest form of art on the planet. And that they should be worshipped the way the Egyptians worshipped the sun. That's a Salvador Dali painting. It's called, Look at That Ass. <laughs> this painting is from 1881, and she is still fuckable. <laughs> this painting proves that women can be talked into anything. Hey, that's a Picasso, everybody. That must have been the most normal-looking girl Picasso ever went out with. Because as we all know, he likes some pretty fucked up looking women. Oh, baby, don't worry that you have a titty growing out of your neck. I love a girl with a titty growing out of her neck. I mean it. Come to my studio. I would love to paint the titty that grows from your neck. So uh, I, I graduated from high school when I was 18, and I went on the road. I, two weeks after I graduated from high school, I was booked in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I drove all, halfway across the United States to MC for $150. <laughs> and I'll never forget pulling into Tulsa, man. It was, I could have been doing the Tonight Show. I was so excited. I was like, man, I'm in show business. <laughs> Shit, now I'd fire my manager if I had to go to Tulsa. <laughs> 
But uh, being a comedian, I've traveled all over, and I've met so many weird and beautiful and interesting people. And, you know, being a comedian is like having a passport to freaky land. <laughs> I was in Appleton, Wisconsin years ago, and there was these two girls that came to my show, and they were talking to me afterwards, and they were nurses, and they worked together at this local hospital. And they were telling me that they were really good friends and that they, they wanted to have sex with a guy together. And they chose this guy that they worked with at the hospital. And they had sex with him. And he told everybody. And they were mortified with embarrassment. Everyone in the hospital where they worked knew. Everyone in the little town where they lived knew. So then it dawns on me why they're telling me the story. I'm from out of town. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anybody but strangers and comedy audiences for the rest of my life. <laughs> and we go back to my hotel room and it's on, baby. And I had never been with two women before. I didn't know what threesome etiquette was. I pulled out a joint and I go, hey, do you guys wanna smoke some pot? And I swear to God, they looked at each other and they went, oh my God, there's drugs? We gotta go. <laughs> and they left. And that was the loneliest joint I've ever smoked in my life. I was, Why didn't I wait until afterwards to offer to him? <laughs> Banging chicks and cashing checks. That has got to be the most callous and moronic tattoo I have ever seen in my life. And that tattoo belongs to this moron. He lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. And that is his mantra. It's a good thing he wasn't one of our founding fathers. Otherwise, chiseled above all of our post offices would be banging chicks and cashing checks. Gay is not okay. High water pants are not okay, bitch. At least gay people know how to buy pants, man. This is interesting photo. But I, I've traveled all over. I've always had a camera with me. This was in Austin, Texas, which is really curious because Otherwise, Austin is a very hip, liberal, open-minded town, so that's why it's even more bizarre that this happened there. But look at this. If you look closer, it, this boy is a child, man. He's 12 years old. The kids across the street are no more than 11, 13. And it was such a curious sight. They're protesting this Honda dealership in Austin. And I stopped, and there was a dude. He looked like Moses. I figured he was in charge. Look, the word of God condemns homosexual acts. That's what his sign says. I was, so I was like, hey, man. What's happening? And I swear to God, the guy goes, well, it seems some people who claim to be Christians have hired some homosexuals to sell Hondas. <laughs> and the Lord don't want homosexuals selling Hondas. Does it say that in the Bible? It could be in there. I admit, I skipped around a lot. I thought the whole point of the book was love your neighbor. Doesn't say go to his work and fucking bother him. <laughs> if those people truly would have been following the Bible, their signs would have said, my gay neighbor drives a Honda and I love him. <laughs> my Peter Licking neighbor gets 44 miles to the gallon on the highway. And when he doesn't have a ball sack draped across his nose, he is getting 33 in the city. I love my Peter Licking Honda driving neighbor. I love him. <laughs> hey, uh, one curious thing I, uh, in my travels, I, I love to go to uh, graves of people I admire. This is me at Jack Kerouac's grave in Lowell, Massachusetts. Jack Kerouac ruined my life. I read On the Road when I was a teenager, and all I ever wanted to do was travel, man, and see the world, and be like Jack, man. Have you ever read On the Road? It's a beautiful book, written in the late 1940s, about a guy hitchhiking back and forth across the United States. Could you imagine hitchhiking across America today? Do you know how many guys you would have to blow at knife point? Ah, ah. You never mentioned any of this, Mr. Kerouac. Ah. Uh, I just wanted to pick cotton with a Mexican girl and sleep in a tent. <laughs> Jack Kerouac died drunk and alone at his mother's house in Florida. 
I think of that often when I am drunk and alone at my mother's house in Florida. That's me at Jimi Hendrix's grave in Renton, Washington. Move over, Rover. I love Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix is one of the prophets of my religion. Up there with Muhammad Ali and Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Listen to what Jimi has to say about reincarnation. I just want to talk to you. I won't do you no harm. I just want to know about your different lives on this here people farm. I have lived here before, many days and hours. And that is why I am so concerned for the earth, because I came back to find the stars all misplaced and the smell of a world that is burning. <laughs> Musical interlude. <laughs> oh, there she is, my first love, a 1978 Cadillac sedan. <laughs> oh my God. I love that car. <laughs> Actually, that is my first uh, adult love story. That's Natalie. She was from Paris, man. We lived together in San Francisco for seven years. She was fantastic. She had the greatest French accent. Oh, baby, we need some bread and some milk. You need to get your panties off. And I love Natalie, man, and I wanted to marry her, but she was European. She was all open-minded. She was like, oh, baby, I do not need that ring on my hand to know you are my man. She would also say, baby, I do not care if you have sex with other women. Just do not give your heart to anyone else but me. I was young. I was stupid, man. I wish I'd have known what a good deal she was laying down. <laughs> Natalie was fantastic, man. We, all, we never, it's funny, when you, years later after you break up with somebody, when you think about the stupid things you argued about, we only ever argued about one thing. She would always say, John Wayne is gay. <laughs> you shut your mouth, you blasphemous whore. <laughs> she, Everyone in France knows John Wayne is gay. Everyone in France knows John Wayne is gay? And I would get so upset, man. <laughs> and then it's funny, you know, years after we broke up, now whenever I see a John Wayne movie, he, he does enter every room like the biggest queen ever, man. I love Natalie, man. I, uh, I took French in high school, and I got a D. And that always pissed me off, because I really worked off my ass off in that class. And, I, and it kept me off the baseball team that year. Mrs. Lee, bitch whore. You guys should really do comedy. It's very therapeutic. So the first time I ever went to Paris with Natalie, Natalie got sick one night. And I went out by myself. And there's this street in the Bastille area of Paris. It's called the Rue de Lap. And there's all these bars on it. And I'm walking. And there was a bar called Some Girls. I'm like, Some Girls, that's the name of a Rolling Stones album. I love the Rolling Stones. I go in. They only play the Rolling Stones. And I'm in heaven, man. I'm in there. I'm drinking beer brewed by monks. I'm taking little notes, and I'm happy with my own company, which is a very rare thing. And uh, I kept wanting to leave, and then they play another cool song like Can You Hear Me Knocking or Moonlight Mile, and I just kept staying, man. And then finally I left, and it was a really thin street in Paris, and these two guys are walking towards me, and I got mugged. One guy had a pole, and he jams me in his stomach with it. And it's go time, baby. It's two against one, and I'm not proud of it. I don't know where it came from. I barked at them. Rev! And that made the dude with the pole start wailing on me, man. But it was winter and I had a big coat on and it actually didn't hurt too bad. But I did not wear glasses at the time. And I looked to see what dude number two is doing. I looked at dude number two and he maced me right in the eyeballs. And I've never felt such excruciating pain in my life. You have no idea how many nerve endings are in your eyes. And I freaked out and I wheeled my arms and I broke free. And I'm running and I'm blinded in all this pain. And it just popped in my head. I went, Ajante! which means nice to meet you. <laughs> I can't believe I got a D in that fucking class, man. I got to apply my shit on the streets of Paris. I bet there were kids that got A's who never got to apply the shit on the streets of Paris. This is one of my favorite things to do in Paris. It's absolutely free. You can lie underneath the monument of love. 
and look up. There's thousands of birds that live in those rafters. It's a beautiful sound of all the birds. How can you not love France, man? They invented lingerie and the bikini. They're not all bad. Hey, uh, I took this picture. This is in Paris, man. I was just walking down the street. Look at that. It's a statue of a woman giving birth. In America, titty fucking drives us crazy. In Paris, they have a statue of a woman giving birth. Look at this. This is a McDonald's advertisement in Paris. <laughs> Two dogs fucking. Why are there no dogs fucking on our McDonald's advertisements? Because we are not free, ladies and gentlemen. The actual translation of this is, I will explain it to you at McDonald's. <laughs> That's my brother John. My brother John thinks I'm girly. He always makes fun of me. He calls me ooh la la man. Is this good enough for you, ooh la la man? His big insult for me is he always says, you know, Tom, you just want to hang out in Europe and smoke cigarettes in cafes and read books that no one else understands. He's described the perfect world to me, man. He thinks it's a put down. I mean, look how cool that is. Who wouldn't want to do that, man? I love wine. My secret ambition is to be a wine reviewer. But I'm American. I have a very limited vocabulary. All my wine reviews would be like, that's some pimp-ass wine. <laughs> Do I smell motherfucking apricot? <laughs> That's what Europe looks like today, man. If you got rid of those top hats and put Puma and Adidas shit on those people, that is exactly <laughs> what Europe look like today. That's me at Voltaire's grave, everybody. Voltaire said that God is a comedian playing in front of an audience, too afraid to laugh. Nobody was laughing when I did the Mr. Rhodes show. <laughs> I had my own sitcom on NBC from 1996 to 90, 1997. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> I played a school teacher, man. They wouldn't give me any jokes. I just gave nice advice to the kids, and I didn't have any adult friends. I just hung out with these kids. In real life, I think someone like that should be closely monitored. <laughs> but they kept telling me, no, it's a great idea. You're a fish out of water, man. You're a fish out of water. My advice to all young comedians, fish out of water, die. But you have no idea how much pressure it is to have your own television show. Imagine a periodical you've loved your whole life telling you you're the biggest piece of shit that ever lived. I had a subscription to Entertainment Weekly. I loved it from its inception. It came to my door, man. And they said that I was the biggest piece of shit that ever lived. Well, that's the way I remembered it. And then about a month or two after the show was on, they did this hair chart. One through five, the best hair on television, number one, David Duchovny, X-Files. And they had a little cut out of his head. Number five, the worst hair on television, Tom Rhodes. And they had a little cut out of my head, man. <laughs> the worst hair on television? How thorough was this investigation? <laughs> Nobody on the Nashville Network or the Fishing Channel had a worse haircut than I did that year? <laughs> Travis Tritt had a feathered mullet that year, for Christ's sake. Anyway, so the show didn't work out, and then a lot of people that I thought were my good friends stopped taking my phone call, and all of show business went ice cold on me. Hey, thanks, show business. <laughs> and that shit hurts. I don't care who you are. <laughs> so I, I, I hated Los Angeles. I was angry at show biz and pissed off at humanity, and I looked at my NBC money as like an artist grant. And I moved to New York City, and I got, uh, I had lived in New York City once before when I was 20, in Washington Heights. I lived there like a dog. It was like the worst year of my life. And I always swore if I ever had any money, I'd live in New York City with style. So I moved to the Wall Street area, and I got a rock star apartment three blocks from the World Trade Center. This is only one block from the World Trade Center. I took this picture. It's too bad that this is a symbol of tragedy now, because this was a monument to love. 
The greatest date in the world was to take a girl to the top of the World Trade Center. But, you know, uh, I wanted to get really back into stand-up comedy, but I, I was so heartbroken and angry uh, that I, I really started, I started drinking and doing drugs like I had never done uh, at that depth in my life. <laughs> and uh, I, I, the Dalai Lama was going to give a speech for free in Central Park on happiness. For six months, I had the flyer on my refrigerator. Nothing was going to make me miss the Dalai Lama's speech on happiness in Central Park. The night before the Dalai Lama speech, I was headlining at Caroline's on Broadway. And there were these two Puerto Rican lesbian strippers that came to me after the show. And they were on ecstasy. And they gave me some ecstasy. And they took me out. And they took me to this crowded dance club in Soho. But I didn't want to be at a crowded dance club, man. But they knew somebody. And we went to this private VIP area behind the DJ. And it was just leather couches. And it was us by ourselves, dancing, having a great time, drinking Pinot Grigio on ice all night. And then we went back to my apartment, and uh, honestly, there was no sex. Me and these two girls stayed in our underwear, and we just hugged and kissed, and it was so tender and beautiful. Uh, and I ended up oversleeping, and I missed the Dalai Lama's speech in Central Park. Now, either I wasn't ready for the Dalai Lama's message, or I think he should look into mine. <laughs> so uh, I actually I was partying so much when I lived in New York City I actually moved to Amsterdam to bring it down a notch <laughs> actually that's not true this is the reason I moved to Holland Anik uh, I, I got in with I got in with Europe through London and once you get in with London, there's clubs all over Europe that you can play. And I, I did a gig in Amsterdam, and I met this girl. She was a waitress at the comedy club. Something about women with trays. I love it. And this was the day, this was the day after I met her. She invited me on the canals of Amsterdam. And it was a beautiful summer day. And she brought wine and strawberries. And I, I fell in love with her. And then Anik taught me to love life again. And stop being angry. And see the beautiful things in life. And... Uh, it, you know, me traveling as a comedian so much killed it like it kills all my relationships. I was actually, I was just back in Holland last month and I saw her. Do not stay friends with your exes, man. It's too painful. I saw her last month. Last month, she's seven months pregnant and married to some dude. She's like, I'm having a baby. I'm like, I got an iPod. Sometimes I'll take my iPod to the park and I'll swing it on the swings. I'll slide it down the slide. My iPod never shits his pants. How many songs does your baby know? My iPod holds 8,000 songs. Can your baby shuffle? But we broke up and I was going to move back to the United States and then these people saw me in a comedy club offering, well, we'll come back to that. This is, I love Holland, man. They're so progressive. I think the Dutch people should be studied like bugs so that the rest of the world could one day become Amster Planet. No, man, they're progressive. They have gay marriages and euthanasia. Look at this. This is a little children's ride. It's a UN helicopter, man. In the United States, that helicopter would have guns on it, and our kids would dream of murdering people. In Holland, their children dream of flying in and stopping the wars, man. So uh, me and Anik broke up, and I was going to move back to the United States. And these, this television network was looking for an American to host an American late-night talk show. And they saw me in a comedy club, and fortuitously, they offered me the job. And uh, my favorite part of the late-night talk show, every episode, there would be a five-minute film where I would uh, experience something of Dutch culture. This guy is a taxi driver in Amsterdam. He's from the Caribbean, and he's got the disco taxi. And there's a disco ball in it, and he drives around, and he's singing. And he only picks up people who look depressed. <laughs> people who look like they need cheering up. And then he sings to them, and he cheers them up, man. Because the man is an instrument built for joy, baby. Oh, ton. This guy 
is a homeless guy from Warsaw, Poland, and his name is Tun. And he plays a two-string banjo in the tunnel that goes through the Rijksmuseum. That's where all the Rembrandt paintings are. And he's a beautiful man. I would buy him beer and go talk to him. And he was such a great guy, man. Uh, he told me that he had come to Amsterdam on a spiritual mission. That God had called him for this mission. The Goldfish Project. It was his philosophy that the reason there's war and violence in the world is that not enough people have goldfish and spend their time meditating upon goldfish. And this mission that God called him on, it was his vision to drain the canals of Amsterdam and fill them with fresh water and goldfish. And one night he got all serious with me, man, and he took me by the shoulders and he goes, Tom, I'm going to make you the general of the goldfish project because I know you can help me get the word out to the people. So everybody, please, buy a goldfish. That's a Rembrandt. Rembrandt, uh, look how fat and out of shape everybody was in Rembrandt's day. Those are probably the two sexiest models he could find. Rembrandt uh, got his fame from uh, doing religious paintings. But then uh, Rembrandt's wife, Saskia, died, and he was uh, having an affair with a servant girl named Hendrixia. Isn't that a beautiful name? Hen Hendrixia. If I ever have a daughter, I want to name her Jimmy Hendrixia. So it was a big scandal, and religious, uh, Amsterdam Religious Society that made him a star uh, crucified him. And they stopped buying his work, and he was bad with his money, and he went bankrupt, and they sold all of his possessions in front of his house. And actually, Rembrandt was buried in the West Church in Amsterdam. And 20 years after he died, Dutch society decided this guy is not going to be important. And they dug him up and buried him in a mass grave on the outskirts, mass unmarked grave on the outskirts of Amsterdam. Dutch people are historically hard to impress. <laughs> it's true. Do you know they have two Christmases in Holland for, to eliminate arguments? So you can spend one day with your mother's family, one day with your father's family. They have two Easters in Holland. Because Dutch people are so hard to impress, Jesus had to come back from the dead twice. <laughs> oh, my God, this is why Amsterdam is the greatest city in the world. A midget in a matador costume. This was at a party I went to, man. Listen, I don't, if, you wanna, if you wanna be my friend, I don't ask for much. All I ask is if you're gonna be my friend and we're ever at a party and there's a midget in a matador costume, please, don't get your thumb in the frame. Jesus Christ. <laughs> please be thumb conscious. I might wanna do a show about my life one day. I, Uh, another thing I love is uh, ice cream trucks. I've taken pictures of ice cream trucks all over the world. I love ice cream trucks because they're not vehicles bringing death and destruction. They're vehicles bringing ice cream and happiness. <laughs> That's a Dutch ice cream truck. That's in Zandam. Look at this. This is Greece. That's a Greek ice cream truck. That's from the island of Rhodes. I went to the island of Rhodes because it's got my name on it. I actually swam naked at the entrance of the harbor of Rhodes, where the Colossus of Rhodes once stood, just in case it would give me superpowers. <laughs> Look at that, man. That's in Peru. That is a Peru. How pimp is the Peruvian ice cream man? <clears throat> if I ever disappear off the planet, you better look in Peru. So the late night talk show ended, and as if I wasn't already the luckiest human being on the planet, the same network gave me a travel show. And for a year, I got to travel all over the world making this travel TV program for Dutch television. And uh, I got to go to Peru. That's me and Machu Picchu, baby. I've been to the top of the Andes. In Peru, they eat hamsters. It's a delicacy. Because we were filming it, I had to try it. And I didn't like it. Thank God. Wouldn't that suck if you found out you loved hamster? <laughs> You'd have to hang out at pet stores all the time. <laughs> they keep dying. <laughs> Maybe the wheel is too tight. <laughs> I loved Peru. Everyone in Peru is this tall. I wish I could see all my rock concerts in Peru.
This is the famous 12-sided stone in Cusco. Cusco was the Rome of the Inca Empire. I've always been fascinated by ancient cultures. That stone is about as big as this screen, actually. And the Incas, uh, in their masonry, they did not use mortar. They were, their whole philosophy behind uh, their masonry was that no stone was too irregular to not fit in place somewhere. What a beautiful metaphor for humanity. <laughs> These are the condors of uh, Peru. I t actually took that picture. The, these, the wingspan on these things are like 18 feet. They're massive. California, actually, we used to have these same birds all over, but we destroyed them. In like the 70s, they disappeared. The condor is monogamous and has the same mate for life. And if anything happens to its mate and dies or gets murdered, the other condor commits suicide because life is too unbearable to live without its soulmate. The koala bear, on the other hand, is promiscuous and has many different sexual partners. <laughs> I was in Australia. I've been going to Australia a lot in the last few years. And uh, when I was a little boy, I had a koala teddy bear. I could not sleep without my koala teddy bear. I'd cry and I'd cry. So the last time I was in Australia, I went to a nature preserve to see the koalas. And the zoologist told me that koalas are promiscuous beings. They have many different sexual partners. And they screw around so much they even get syphilis. I had no idea I was sleeping with such a dirty little slut. <laughs> hey, that's me in Beijing at the Forbidden uh, City, uh, Tommy the Kami. <laughs> it really meant a lot for me to go to, uh, to China because I always thought I was a communist. Well, my whole life I always said I was a communist because it upset my family and I didn't have the courage to be a homosexual. It was the next best thing on the list that would upset my family, man. But I went to China. I'm definitely not a communist. Uh, unfortunately, and, and, and if, you, if you saw the, the movie The Last Emperor, that was actually filmed here. Common people were not allowed to go here uh, for hundreds of years. And it's too bad I don't have a photo of it. And this goes on for miles and miles. It's too bad I don't have a photo of it. There was a Starbucks in the center of this. Not an, a, 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 a full Starbucks with leather chairs, but like a Starbucks booth. And I saw it, and my first reaction was, oh, American bullshit, corporate greed, globalization, ruining the planet, man. And then my second thought was, it's freezing. I'd fucking love some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the Middle East. I took this picture in Dubai of the United Arab Emirates, and she is clearly not loving it. Hey, man, uh, <laughs> a snort. This is a good show. I got a snort. Damn, I can't remember the last time I got a snort. <laughs> I have been to the Middle East, everybody. We have got to make peace with the Middle East, if for no other reason than the Micarabia sandwich. Oh my God, it's delicious. <laughs> it's little Arabic flatbreads with grilled chicken and tzatziki sauce. <laughs> it's funny, McDonald's is one of those uh, companies that I've always had a big issue with. And uh, you know, just American globalization bullshit. This is Shamila. I dated Shamila uh, the last year I lived in, in, in Amsterdam and uh, what a good woman she was, man. She actually managed a McDonald's. Shamila is Moroccan, and in Holland, the Moroccans are discriminated against, and they're blamed for all the problems. It's, it's the, the parallel between uh, our blacks and Mexicans and the way the, Mexi uh, the Moroccans are treated in Holland is remarkable. Uh, and, and especially a, a Moroccan girl in Holland has got very little chance of, of advancing in any kind of good job. She started working at this McDonald's when she was 16, and she was 24 when we dated, and she worked her way all up to manager. And it's funny, I always like hated McDonald's and thought it was bullshit. And Shamila, uh, she lived in a little town 30 miles north of Amsterdam, and it was, like a, it was like a Disney movie, man. She was like Snow White, and all the little kids looked up to her and asked her for advice. And she would clean the milkshake machine. It was someone else's duty to do it, but she didn't trust the kids because it was an intimate job. And I would be 
in the McDonald's after it was closed with her, and she'd have all these parts out and intricately washing the washers and things. And uh, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life was being with Shamila, watching her clean the milkshake machine in McDonald's. And uh, I was wild about her, man, but uh, she was Muslim. And she couldn't tell her family about me because I'm a non-Muslim. And on top of that, I'm a white American, which is really unpopular with European Arabic people for some reason. <laughs> and we had to break up because I was never going to convert to Islam. I mean, I don't know nothing about machine guns. <laughs> How am I going to be Muslim? Ski masks make my face itchy. No booze, no pork, that's a hard program, man. I could give up booze, I don't think I could ever give up barbecue pork. <clears throat> I think that was the problem back in biblical times. They just didn't know how to do the sauce. It's payback time, bitch. America is just out of its mind with bloodlust, and I'm sick of it, man. I am completely against war of any kind, but I think if you're going to have a war, you should never underestimate the power of ridicule. We should fuck with these people a little bit more. Mix it up, man. One day bombs, another day confetti. One day bombs, another day rubber chickens. Oh, shit, I hate rubber chicken day. It's like they're making fun of us or something. Hey, this is Elvis Presley's grave. I love Elvis Presley. I think Elvis is the perfect metaphor for the United States because Elvis started out young and sexy and innovative, and then he became all fat and disgusting and bloated. And I think that's where the United States is now. We're in our fat jumpsuit Vegas Elvis period. <laughs> Too fucked up to know the audience isn't digging us anymore. Oh, man, this audience is digging me, baby. I can do whatever I want, man. I think that the, you know, the problem with, you know, most Americans, 17% oh, of Americans have passports. And I think that's the problem, that uh, most Americans have never traveled, they've never been anywhere. All they have is the recycled opinions they got off of the television set. And I think it's every American's responsibility to live up to the mythology of American greatness. I mean, we're the people that said every man is equal. We have to live up to the, own, to the standards we set for ourselves. It's my brother, John. Uh, <laughs> my brother, John, uh, served in Afghanistan, and he also served in Iraq. When he came back from Iraq, his girlfriend had a brain aneurysm, and she went into a coma, and she's still in a coma. And here's this guy who I've never seen show any sensitivity in his entire life, and he sits with her every night, and he reads to her. My brother John and I, in 2006, we went to Argentina to meet our family. We've got all these cousins down there we had never met before. I learned a lot about myself in Argentina because I've always been moody, arrogant, and a little bitchy. It just turns out I'm Argentinian. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> Tis the way of my people. But I don't speak Spanish. My brother John actually speaks a lot of Spanish, and he carried us on this whole trip. And our relatives took us to this soccer match. And Argentine, Ar uh, Argentines are out of their mind with soccer, man. There was this soccer match we were at, to, we were at and it actually ended in a riot. The, the uh, home team was losing, and they set fire to the stadium. And the cops came in and started shooting tear gas. And it was a scary moment, like, oh, shit, somebody's going to die. And my brother, man, sheltered me and got me out of there, and I was really happy to be this guy's little brother, and we completely disagree on everything, but he's better than a good man. He's a great man, and he's a true American hero. This is one of my uh, older cousins. I met all these cousins of mine. Uh, see, when I was a little boy, when, when you're in school and you get to pick uh, a country and write a report about it, I would always do a report on Argentina because of my mother. And the encyclopedias always talk about the gauchos of uh, Argentina, and this cousin of mine thinks he's a gaucho, and he dresses like a gaucho. His name is Hugo, or as he says, Gaucho Hugo. And he's like batshit crazy, man. 
I mean, seriously, there's a lot of relatives' houses where he's not allowed to go because he's caused a lot of problems in the past. And this guy just would not, he loved me, man, and he just would not leave me alone. And he kept saying the same thing over and over to me. Gaucho Hugo, Tom Arodas, in the garden, no wave of Yorka, and the Europa, and Asiatica, and all the Mujeres. And he kept, it was like, oh, but a big Spanish speech that he kept giving me over and over. And finally, it took me a long time to figure out, he wants to introduce me. He wants to travel with me. Gaucho Hugo, introducing Tom Rhodes. At Madison Square Garden, Nueva Yorka, New York. And then we're gonna go to Europe. And then we're gonna go to Asia. And then we're gonna fuck all the women. I wanna get famous not for the money, just so I could afford to travel and have Gaucho Hugo introduce me wherever I play. That is my motivation, everybody. That's my agenda. So in January of this year, I took my mother back to Buenos Aires, and she had not been back in 40 years, and it was very emotional. She saw her family. She hadn't been back. It was, uh, her, my mother's 67 years old, and her cousin Eddie is also 67 years old, and they had not seen each other since they were 12 years old. And we're walking the streets of Buenos Aires, and they had just remembered this thing, this game that they played when they were little girls because they didn't have any money. They used to play the statue game. And they, and they would spin around in circles, and then they would let go and freeze in whatever position. And that was their statue game. And these old women, man, they must have done it a hundred times, and they would pee with laughter every time they did it. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life, my mother and her cousin Eddie playing the statue game on the streets of Buenos Aires. Uh, <clears throat> I turned 40 in January, and I took tango lessons for the month, and I did the tango in Buenos Aires on my 40th birthday because that was my dream. And most of my dreams uh, have all come true, so it's time to come up with new dreams. You know, uh, that's me. That's the same boy from that beach. I just want to say that the whole message of the life of Jesus Christ is don't be an asshole. And I think the message of every religion of the world, if you boil it down, is the same message. Don't be an asshole. And that's my message, and that's the message of this show. And uh, how do you not be an asshole? It's through love and forgiveness. And my name is Tom Rhodes, and I am an instrument built for joy. Could have shine, never learned to read so well, but he always understood. Ever had a question, need to look back over his childhood and say, Keep it simple, keep it fun. Keep it simple, keep it fun, yeah. Keep it simple, keep it fun. Be a good Try not to hurt no. Well, my boss may be a crook, oh, but I really don't mind. All I gotta do is remember the color inside the lines. Keep it simple, keep it fun.
Too late, I got too high. 